Um, okay, so that's what I was trying, uh, starting to say that the call is going to be recorded. Okay, the webinar is going to be recorded. And today we're going to talk about cohesion policy, okay, and in particular a project that with our guests here, with colleagues, um, we run in Serbia and Montenegro about cohesion policy, about how to adjust regional policy of these countries to cohesion policy. This is chapter 22, okay, which is one of the fundamental uh, pillar in the in the way of uh, accessing the European Union. Um, just to recall the agenda, uh, we have 15 minutes of welcome remarks. Uh, then we're going to have a discussion with our two guests from the European Union, DG Regio and DG Near. Uh, then we're going to present the results of the project and discuss some follow-up. And then we have a final uh, half minutes for a final discussion uh, with our two guests from the Italian institutions, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Cohesion Policy Department, which are the two uh, institutions which mostly deal with cohesion policy. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to uh, take much time and I'm going to leave the floor to Professor Giulio Salerno, who is the director of our institute at the National Research Council of Italy. Uh, Giulio, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I am Giulio Salerno, I am the director of uh, CNR CIFA. I am very glad to welcome you to the final webinar of the project programming the EU cohesion policy, the change program on chapter 22 on Serbia Montenegro. Uh, you know that this uh, project started in the end of 2022 and it is supported within the uh, Know How Change Program by the Central European Initiative Fund at the European Bank of, of, uh, for the Reconstruction and Development, contributed by the Italy. Our institute, uh, Siena Sirfa, coordinated the activities in partnership with Observatorio Balcani, Caucaso, Trans Europa. And the beneficiary partners include the Ministry of European Affairs of Montenegro, the Ministry of European Integration of Serbia, and uh, the European Fund of the Autonomous Province of Vojvodina. Siena CFA is one of the institutes of the National Research Council in Italy, the main public research body in Italy. Our institute uh, deals with re regionalism, federalism and self-government from different perspectives, including expertise in law, economy, sociology, geography. Focusing on regions, we have a specific interest in, in the European cohesion policy, which is the most relevant investment policy in the European Union, and an important instrument to address territorial inequities and disparities also in Italy. We develop different projects and activities regarding cohesion policy, including research, training, and dissemination. Cohesion policy is a crucial component of the EU integration process, and as it is the instrument designed not to leave places behind, but rather to promote a balanced and healthy European Union as a whole. As other policies, it has its own rules and technical aspects, which can represent a challenge burden for public administration. For this reason, we believe it is particularly important for countries that are involved in the enlargement process to develop competences on cohesion policy. More than that, we believe that advancing in the understanding and preparation for cohesion policy which is requested by Chapter 22 of Enlargement Process, can help candidate countries to advance also in other dimensions of EU policies, as cohesion is a complex and transversal policy that cuts through other policy domains. This was the main assumptions at the basis of the project we will present today and we are very glad to have the opportunity to discuss these topics with European and Italian high-level representatives that I would like to thank for accepting our invitation. To conclude, 
I also like to thank all the partners for the excellent change. And we are very satisfied with the results of our projects and we look forward to continue our collaboration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, thank you very much, Director. Uh, the next is um, um, Luisa Chiodi. Dr. Luisa Chiodi, she's director of the other partner which was involved in the project, the Osservatorio Balcani Causa Trans Europa. It's an observatory which has a long tradition in, uh, in a lot of activities and projects running uh, in the Balkan area. So, uh, Luisa, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Director Salerno. A couple of words on my side. We are a think tank and a non-profit media specialized on Southeast Europe, Turkey, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus. And we work on a number of EU policies in the field of media freedom, civil society, enlargement, and cohesion. Um, we have 24 years of experience in knowledge, uh, knowledge sharing and dialogue among uh, stakeholders, different stakeholders working for the EU integration of Southeast Europe in particular. And we're very happy that our collaboration with ISIRFA in the last four years uh, has been very fruitful. Um, we've been working together on regional policy for uh, European integration process in the Western Balkans with research, with dissemination activities, with trainings, exchanges, um, as the one we are discussing today. So, um, of course, uh, uh, we believe that this trend of activity is particularly important for the enlargement process. And um, uh, uh, we are also very happy that we will continue working on this uh, very specific uh, uh, experience uh, with a new grant from the same donors, um, the CHE Fund of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development with the contribution of the G Europe of the Italian Ministry. Um, this new year, we will engage with colleagues, new colleagues of other two candidate countries, Albania and North Macedonia, and we hope uh, um, to, to be able to build a, a regional a cooperation framework uh, for this purpose. I, I wish you a good um, work today and uh, look forward to hearing your uh, speeches. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luisa. Yeah, we did work very well together over the past years and we're looking forward to keep working uh, on that. So now we are entering the um, second part of the agenda, um, which includes two... Um, uh, speakers from the European Union, uh, Dr. Uh, Gilles Kittel, European Commission DG Near, and then uh, Dr. Nelly Tim, European Commission DG, sorry, DG Regio, the first DG Near, uh, the second. Um, I can anticipate that at the end of these two um, speeches, we can collect a couple of questions or clarifications. So uh, please uh, take a note and uh, at the end, we might benefit from you know a short discussion, five ten minutes. So now I'm leaving the floor to uh, Gilles Kittel, DG Regio. Yes, hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I will. I will see if you. Do you see my presentation? I think they are coming. Just a second. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We will try to enlarge. Okay. Very good. So good morning. I'm very glad to be with you. I would like to thank first the organizers uh, for the invitation uh, to, 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 to me. And, uh, and I will say just a very a short words about myself and my team. So we are working, as it was said, in DG Regio, so uh, working on regional and urban policy in the EU. And my team and my unit, we are more dedicated to the external, let's say, countries. So the countries surrounding the EU, with whom we have what we call territorial cooperation. So either cross-border, uh, transnational or inter-regional programs. We have as well macro-regional strategies. Uh, and we have the chapter 22 negotiation. So in my team, we are dealing with uh, South uh, East Europe. So that means uh, Western Balkans, Turkey, Turkey, and the surrounding member states. In the surrounding member states, we are working essentially with them through the strategy for the Adriatic and Union region. So that's the scope of the work. The team is about, let's say, six, seven people. 
And, and therefore, you see, we are indeed involved uh, in the Chapter 22 discussion with Serbia and Montenegro, clearly. So I will try to be short. I would like also to apologize already that I cannot stay too long with you because I have another presentation, a physical one here in Brussels on biodiversity, you see, in the region, in my region, the Atlantic Union region, just after you. And I'm expected, you see, it's not too far from, from the office, you see, at 12, you see, so I need to run immediately after this presentation. So I apologize for that, but obviously I would be glad to answer a question either directly after the presentation or in writing. Uh, later on. Thank you. So I will try now to move on with the presentation. So to present you the situation as we see it, at least from our side, my colleague Tim will complement. And obviously she has the, the engineers, uh, let's say, view. So there are aspects where she's certainly much more knowledgeable than, than us in video. The modernization of the chapter 22, as we see it, and that's based on a study that was carried out by NALET, that's a Serbian uh, organization that uh, carried out some work for us uh, in the period 2020-2021. And then the conclusion that we can draw from this study uh, with regard to your work and the discussion we have today. So you see, I took first this picture. It's not, uh, let's say, an hazard is just to say the road is nice, but it is a bit cloudy, uh, as you can see. It's climbing, you see, you need to climb a little bit. It's not too steep, but still. Um, and that that's, uh, we think, you see, so this is a nice journey. Huh? You see, the landscape is beautiful. So we think we need to remain positive, you see, despite all the obstacles that we have faced. So about first, let's say the instruments that we have uh, in the EU, you see, to help, obviously first Montenegro and Serbia, but I would say the, even the other countries in the region. We have the revised enlargement methodology. So you know that that was revised in February, 2020. I will not now go too much into the details, but just mention a few, few things. The economic investment plan for the Western Balkans, the green agenda that was attached to it in October 2020. They are, and that's those are much more recurrent instruments, the TIEX and training instruments that I assume you, you might be familiar with. Um, you have then the instrument for pre-accession, IPA3, which is something that obviously the two countries are benefiting from. Some multilateral initiatives and platform in the Western Balkans. So it's also to flag that we are aware and we are working obviously with other initiatives, not only for partially sometimes financed by sometimes not at all. So I mentioned here the Berlin process, the Southeast European cooperation, the Western Balkan regional economic area and so on. So there are many. You are mentioned as well, Central European initiatives, you see. Um, there are as well sectoral platforms that we are working with like the energy community, transport community. And then we have to also to consider the bilateral technical assistance from member states. And we have some member states which are, which are particularly active, let's say, in the region in, in Kenya. Then the last bullet point is about the upcoming initiative. Some are really close to the adoption, uh, especially if it's on the growth plan for the Western Balkans. You have certainly uh, heard about it and the European political community, which is a bit more political, let's say, a political instrument of the EU. Those things, as you understand, are essentially handled by DGNR, not by us, but obviously we uh, work in a good, let's say, intelligent and good coordination. And we try to uh, build up on those, those, those different elements that I've just presented to you. So that's certainly important to consider when we are talking about the accession of Montenegro and Serbia, because they, they should help those countries to make their journey towards the EU. Now, you see about the study that I mentioned to you, uh, let's say very quick words about, let's say, the situation as it was uh, assessed and which is still valid. So obviously the different candidate countries and potential candidates at a different level of, let's say, uh, progress. Montenegro and Turkey are still the most advanced, although with Turkey, you know, the uh, let's say the dialogue is is complicated, but it's more at political level, at technical level. We, we, we try to have still uh, regular contact with them. Uh, Serbia 
is, let's say, just behind. And then you have North Macedonia and Albania with whom, with which we have uh, just opened now. We have, uh, we have we had the screening meetings. And then Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo, which are lagging a little bit behind. So that's overall the situation, but I'm sure you are familiar. You see, if you are working on those topics, you are, you are quite familiar with this. Uh, what is important for us when we are talking about accession is first the uh, management mode. So again, I, I hope it's not too, let's say, it's too not a jargon, you see, you are not familiar with, but uh, the way we are implementing the EU funds, uh, there are different management modes. And the ones that it needs to be favored to prepare a country is what we call indirect management by beneficiary country, where we actually transfer the responsibility to the structures. We entrust them, and then they have to demonstrate their capacity to uh, take even strategic decision with the way those funds are used. Um, and in that context, because there, so we have indirect management by beneficiary country, which is really important for chapter 22, but you have other, other management modes like internet, indirect management by international organizations. You have as well direct management or what we call sector budget support. Yeah, I just mentioned sector budget support because that's something that TGNR has recently used more often, let's say. We think it's useful, but it has to be really well targeted as, uh, let's say, an added value, but it has to be really used in complement with, with uh, the indirect management by beneficiary country, which is the preferred mode to prepare a country for Chapter 22. When we are thinking now, so I move to IPA 3, the instrument, as it exists now, um, we think that in the future, it could be more focused on Chapter 22. That, that is clear, that was the result of the study. Uh, and we don't deny, you see, that they already initiative, especially the engineer has launched different technical assistance uh, actions, especially in Serbia, and is about launching something in Montenegro. So that will certainly help. But, but for sure in the future, uh, probably the instrument should be more aligned with the policy objectives of, of the cohesion policy. Um, I just move forward and because otherwise we won't have time. Another element which is important uh, to consider, although it might look technical, is the management information system. The cohesion policy as it exists nowadays is extremely computerized. And the way even we are monitoring, and now we say that we want to be even more performance-based than we were. You know, we are already now in the period 21, 27, but we will be even more after 27. Let's say the, the precondition for this is to have a, a very, I would say, deep uh, and, and solid uh, IT system. Because you need to collect a lot of data, you need to aggregate them, you need to be able to uh, mine, let's say, them as well. Uh, and that requires really a very exhaustive uh, IT system. So this is not actually just a technical detail. And the way you, you design the system, because each member state has designed its system, uh, let's say, on its own, there is no model imposed by the commission. This is obviously a very uh, critical element and that takes time because you don't design such a complex system just in a few weeks or a few months. And that has obviously to be aligned also with the policy choices that you are making. So again, this looks technical, but this is not technical. This is actually quite fundamental. And that might be really the backbone, let's say, of uh, your progress for chapter 22. Um, the other thing that I want to mention based on this study, and which is, um, we think, also important in, for preparation of two countries for cohesion policy, is, and that we took note, maybe that one will be say uh, even more afterwards, is the, 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 the national authorities in general uh, enjoy, let's say, the direct contact with us. But you know that for the time being, the political decision is that DG, IPA is managed let's say, exclusively by the engineer, we are supporting them, but we don't have normally direct contact with the national authorities when we talk about the funds and the sexual operation programs managed by the engineer. 
But that was not the case, and sometimes that was a bit regretted by some countries uh, under IPA 1, let's say the period 27, 2013. So it's already some time ago, but at that time, the two line DG region and employment had more direct contact with the uh, countries, especially Serbia and Montenegro. But again, I'm repeating for the time being, this is not uh, anymore the case, and, and there's no decision for the time being, you see, to change that. So I don't know whether this is something that will be touched, but this is, let's say, a political choice that the Commission is making. Uh, what I can say also with regard to the progress of the two countries, and in general, all countries, you understand those remarks are not only for Montenegro and Serbia, is that it's very important to connect Chapter 22 with the other chapters. In reality, Chapter 22 is a way to put in motion many yaki that you are discussing in many other chapters. So that's why also it's, in a way, so challenging. And in that context, what we can notice, not only in the two countries, but generally, is a lack of coordination. Because that means that your working groups working on Chapter 22 need to be quite large. They need to have a very broad overview of uh, the progress made by the country, not only in Chapter 22, but on many chapters. So that is clearly challenging. And that calls for a strategic approach because also sometimes the progress that you make or you don't make on some chapters might block you for your progress on chapter 22. So that's also something not to, to keep in mind. So now about the modernization, you see you have the choice. I'm not saying that one is more modern than the other one. You see it's a question of taste. Um, but, um, and sustainability maybe, I don't know. Um, but here, um, what we say, you see, observing a bit what is happening in, in the countries, is first that, and that's linked also to the remark I made about the chapters, that the role of DG Rejo and the role in the cohesion policy as such should not be limited just to uh, the chapter, uh, let's say, or the cluster called resource agriculture and cohesion. Uh, because in reality, you are mobilizing many other elements which are discussed, for instance, in the cluster competitiveness and inclusive growth or green agenda and sustainability connectivity. And, and, and that's another, you see, uh, to, just to highlight the complexity of the chapter. In reality, you need really to uh, have a very broad uh, understanding, you see, of all those elements if you want to uh, make the right choices when you are preparing for chapter 22. Now, you see also about chapter 22, a few more elements you see that I flag here. You understand there are many, but what that we can notice when we're discussing with the countries is first uh, the link that you need to make with the European semester. You know, that's an uh, ex important exercise for the EU. And, and although we know that countries are preparing for, for this, uh, then you need to make a link also with the, cohesion, the future cohesion policy. And again, the choices that you will make, you see, under this future cohesion policy. The other element, which is also very important, is obviously the SDG and the SDG reforms, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals. That's not something only uh, handled at EU level. This is a general objective that we have all. But that is also, and that calls also for a territorialization of, of the policies, of the cohesion policy, uh, but also of the programs that you are designing. Urban policy and EU urban agenda, as I told you in my introduction, we are dealing not only with a regional policy, but as well urban policy. And clearly the cities nowadays are really a key drivers of changes. Change in terms of uh, environmental protection, in terms of mobility, in terms of immigration, in terms of security. So again, we need to have, you see, it's part of this territorialization, let's say, of our policy, but it's very important also to differentiate, in a way, what we are doing in the cities from what we are doing in the rest of the territories, with the idea that obviously we don't separate the two groups. Huh? So there are also important links to make between the rural areas and, and, and the cities. Uh, and that drives me to the last point, which is the territorial cohesion. So that's what really we want to achieve through the cohesion policy is really to uh, ensure uh, to reduce the disparities and to ensure a relatively harmonious development of all the territories in the country and in Europe, ultimately. So about chapter 22, 
what where we think we need to have, let's say, in EPA using the future instrument. We don't know how it will be called after EPA. You see, to prepare the two countries is clearly also a, a more for better focus on local and regional authorities uh, because they need uh, they, they they play a very active role and and uh, uh, it's something really to to be considered probably more mm -hmm. uh, although they are you know, activities action financed by near already. But uh, probably a, a bigger push should be made, you see, on, on those two, if countries want to progress fast on chapter 22. So now, uh, my conclusions, which are also based on, on this study, is first, the time perspective matters, obviously. You understand the way you prepare yourself. It's not the same if you are five years in, ahead of you or 10 years. And that also, uh, that's obviously extremely important to consider. Obviously, this is, uh, you can only make assumption because nobody knows actually when uh, countries will uh, have uh, real chances to exceed. But, but that has obviously an enormous importance for the preparation under chapter 22. Because as I say, it's not only about transposing the key, it's also to prepare structures, to prepare an IT system, to uh, recruit people, to train them, to ensure that really you can put in motion a lot of things of uh, EU laws and, and, and following that even secondary legislation that you need to develop as well uh, and to be sure that you can really implement that and you can deliver something based on that. Uh, obviously, uh, we understand that there's a, a call for a stronger involvement of DG Radio and the member states in this uh, program. Yes, uh, on chapter 22. That's something that we, we, we hear and we will see. You see, there are discussions obviously in Brussels on this. Um, the third point is to say uh, it's very important also that sometimes countries in the region, they shift from this idea that they should just absorb funds, but rather reduce disparities. So they, you see, uh, sometimes there is a bit an obsession to... Uh, to, to yeah, not to lose money, in putting simple words, which is not obviously the goal, as you understand, of our policy. Our policy is really to to deliver something tangible uh, to the citizens, and these disparities are absolutely uh, critical uh, in that system. The fourth point is about the administrative capacities. To highlight here that the effort is not only on a few central structures, but as I told you, is really an ecosystem that you need to make. Uh, and when we say an ecosystem, that means that clearly we want to put more emphasis on local and regional authorities, but also on a lot of stakeholders which will help you to implement the policy choices. We are thinking about the universities, the banking sector, uh, the, 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 the business. I mean, uh, many, many other actors are absolutely essential if you want to make the right choices under cohesion policy. And again, that should be, they should be part of the endeavor to the preparation of chapter 22. Uh, in that context, uh, we, we think, you see, and we hope that the next instrument will be, obviously we'll consider all those elements. And as I say, there is a reflection on our side after 27 to be even more performance oriented. And that would be also obviously important for Serbia and Montenegro. I will just, you see, move now very quickly and finish because I think I've already exhausted, yeah, exhausted my time. Just to say uh, very, again, practically, concretely, what we want to avoid is the scenario we face with Croatia, which was the last country exceeding the, the EU, where actually for some years, Croatia faced an enormous, let's say, uh, absorption shock, if I can put it like this, these structures were simply not designed for the jump that they made in terms of EU funds because at the EPA they were managing a few hundred million euros and then they got a few billion euros. And you can understand this is uh, obviously this uh, uh, provides for more challenges. So in that respect, it's also important that we uh, learn from this experience. And, and, and that is something that obviously we factor in when we are preparing a Serbia and Montenegro. Um, in that context, also, we think that the interreg IPA program, so the, you know, I told you uh, when I started my speech that I'm working on territorial cooperation. So those are programs between member states and IPA countries, Canadian countries. Uh, 
Uh, those programs can be, although their budgets are quite limited, but that's also obviously an occasion for the countries to experience what we call shared management, uh, which is probably uh, where really the, the countries have to exercise, let's say, uh, their responsibility. Um, and therefore, it's so important also that when uh, and, uh, this generation of interact program was designed like that to prepare again better uh, the kind of countries for, for the accession through those programs. So um, we think that uh, those programs are useful for uh, the preparation. As I told you, obviously, we are working together with the engineer, and I'm sure my colleagues will tell you more to see how they are putting the emphasis uh, on, on the two countries and, and what uh, is important. They have let's say they are steering the whole process but we are uh, obviously observing everything and participating to the chapter 22 discussion and and we try to design all the tools we have instruments to to help obviously in that context um, with with all the countries and especially uh, serbia and montenegro so i don't know if there are questions at this stage or we, we yeah sorry Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so many, many insights. Uh, the first is that cohesion policy is linked to so many other relevant policy aspects. And also, I like very much the point about absorption, the obsession about absorption. Uh, um, and also the idea of, you know, um, providing ex ante training for institutions, especially regional ones, to be to be ready. Uh, for countries that are going to join the EU. Uh, yeah, we'll collect if there are a few questions. So we have so that uh, Dr. Kittel, um, then he has to leave us. So if there are some questions, um, I don't know, okay, collect them. Uh, can you please uh, close the, um, the presentation? Yeah. Yes, th yes, thank you, sir. I, all right, okay. I have so, a very short one, if I may. Okay. Uh, very, very technical and yeah. very short. Uh, I was interested in, in the thing that you mentioned about the management information system, which uh, actually appears to be very, very technical. But as you said, uh, it's, it's not only technical. I mean, it's something which is needed. Uh, so I would like to ask you if there is any specific program that you are carrying out about training or, I mean, within IPA for, for these countries to to set up this system? Let's say we have actually a program that we designed for the interact programs and which can be a source of inspiration. So obviously it's a much smaller scale, let's say, and that's developed by interact. You know, it's one of our, our programs supporting the others. Uh, it's a interregional program, so called interact. And they have developed different systems that can help the countries to capture data. It's also to link those data with the accounting system because you know there are a lot of interfaces to be created in order to also ensure consistency and uh, our audit trail. Um, as I say, also if you move to the what we call the simplified cost options, so the you you, you go where you are more performance oriented, it's absolutely essential that you you have all those systems up and running. So yeah, we I mean for Interact we have not for the we call them mainstream program. The big programs then it's up to the, the, the member states to decide which system they want to use. Thank you. Louisa raised her yeah, hand. I'd, I'd like to ask you uh is it how do we avoid this um, uh, Croatian scenario? Because um, uh, apparently, uh, although the new growth plan uh, um, adds new resources, it does in a non uh, IPA way, so in, a, in a, with a new uh, different structure. So, and anyway, is not uh, proportionate to what any member state uh, receives. So, what is the strategy for for avoiding that? Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, as you understand, it's obviously there are political choices uh, which uh, are beyond, let's say, our willingness or our own uh, suggestions and recommendations. But for sure, a bigger emphasis on capacity building and, and I mean, real 
uh, practical capacity building. That's why we are encouraging, for instance, much more exchanges, uh, second, uh, second man uh, also uh, plan. So for instance, we have in mind now here in Rio to launch some second man actions where we will allow uh, a quite a number of, of people from those administrations to visit other managing authorities or, or even uh, we, you see the commission, in order to also grasp better, practically speaking, uh, what this uh, preparation induces. And, and, and obviously, in parallel, we, we, we are trying to coordinate with the, the other actors, let's say like Digineer, but, but there are others as well, to mobilize more uh, funds for, for capacity building, but in a specific capacity building, as I said, to be more targeted, more. Uh, but again, uh, you are right that the, the changes are, are significant. Thank you. Uh, I guess we can collect a third very short question. Otherwise, we take advantage of uh, keep the availability of respond even later. Okay. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. We know you have to go. So just you know, uh, goodbye and see you. Uh, see you soon. Um, so I'll, I'm happy to leave the floor to Dr. Uh, Nelly Tim, European Commission DG Nia. Please. Hello. Dobar dan. Buongiorno. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for inviting uh, me here uh, to present uh, out of the point of view of uh, of DG Nia. Um, I mean, all of this, Gilles made an exemplary uh, introduction on, on where we stand in general on the cohesion policies uh, in the Western Balkans uh, in particular. I can just maybe add that um, Ukraine and Moldova are also approaching now the, uh, the enlargement steps and, and we are approaching the, uh, the bilateral and, uh, and questions and answers meetings already at this year. So... But Serbia and Montenegro are, are, are the front runners, and I'm very happy to see that uh, the member states, uh, Italy in this particular case, is taking the initiative of uh, offering uh, technical assistance and uh, collaboration uh, to share its experience. So I have a short presentation. Um, let me see if I can share it. I actually can. Great. Uh, window entire screen. Just a second. Yeah, we can see it. Excellent. So I just start quickly. So I'm the new chapter desk at Teaching Year um, for 22, chapter 22. Uh, so how DG uh, near works uh, with the enlargement uh, process in general, it's, it's kind of um, coordinating the entire process, um, interacting with the line DGs. In case of Chapter 22, it's, it's DG Regio, DG Employment. So our collaboration is very tight because at DG near we can't have the uh, expert knowledge, which is essential to guide the, uh, the countries in its process. And the teaching year, there's a person who is responsible to see, uh, to have an overarching view on, on the chapters. And, um, and my, my role is on the 22. But otherwise, I am placed at the, at the uh, unit which deals with IPA planning, reporting and coordination for Western Balkans. So, uh, so that goes into the second field, what the engineer is very much doing. Um, and where our uh, collaboration with the uh, with the DGs is, is is hyper important is that we are uh, in charge of the uh, the main funding instruments that are going to the uh, towards the Western Western Balkans. So in this case, it is IPA uh, instrument for pre-accession assistance that we are we are coordinating and managing and trying to improve on a daily basis. So let's see next. Light. Yeah, you are. I mean, I don't need to go through what is chapter twenty-two about. It's about the cohesion and me, making I, sure. Sorry, that the... can I interrupt you? Of we, course. We still see the first slide, even sort of weird. Ah, okay. Quite small for some reason. 
All right, because interesting because I see it. It looks like a presentation style, smaller <laughs> okay. and, and freeze on the first slide. All right, the freezing I don't know because I can I can free I can move very freely. I'm just seeing how I can resume slideshow. You Maybe. still see the the same uh, same yeah. same slide? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Okay, think... so then I will hand over, um, and uh, maybe someone can help me. Ah, here. Do you see no, now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Great. Um, challenges of the IT, right? Uh, so yes, it is a critical uh, critical chapter in the entire enlargement uh, package because it's kind of an umbrella. And uh, it brings together all the efforts uh, all the other chapters are doing in order to prepare a country for uh, for accession. So a number of things that need to be done, um, and you're already doing that, uh, both in Serbia and Montenegro, it's, it's to streamline the legal, uh, legal framework, make sure that institutional uh, capacity is there, administrative capacity, that the monitoring evaluation structures are there, um, Etc. Etc. Um, yes. So and the links with the uh, with the other key was already mentioned by Jayla very much. So what what we can do from the DG uh, near side and uh, from the European Union in general uh, is to support the entire process with with uh, funding instruments and opportunities. So here comes in place this instrument for pre-accession uh, assistance, IPA. It is now on the third, third term, um, and IPA's general aim is to prepare for the for the EU's membership. So that includes also Chapter Twenty Two, and uh, we provide financial assistance, technical assistance, uh, so all in order to uh, align with EU rules, standards, practices, and and to progress thus. Uh, to the towards the membership. Let me see. Yes, and then coming back to the needs. So more concretely, um, there are technical assistance projects in place. There is currently ongoing project, uh, both in Montenegro and, and Serbia to assist the national, uh, national structures and also to prepare for the operational programs. Uh, the instruments which are constantly available um, are mostly TIEX, which relates to the, also to the uh, sharing of experience either between the, the countries on the same path um, and also to share experience uh, in this case with the, with, the last, with the previous countries of the enlargement or the other EU member states, for example. It can be also, also Italy on, on their uh, perspectives and experience. And um, as I'm coming from Estonia, I, I started my, my work with the EU at the Ministry of uh, Finance in Estonia when Estonia was, uh, was progressing towards EU. And, and I remember having uh, quite big twinning projects uh, supporting uh, the full, uh, full preparation for Chapter 22. So I, I, I would suggest that when the time is right, this instrument is, is especially useful to make the final push and make sure that... Uh, that everything is, is prepared for the accession. Of course, there are also budget supports, uh, there are grant schemes, um, there is um, CBC, territorial cooperation projects. Uh, so, so the funding is going into a very different, uh, diverse uh, uh, streams, uh, all with the same, um, same idea behind uh, to increase the um, the cohesion, um, decrease the, the, um, the, the discrepancies and uh, to assist the administrations in their preparations. Um, so yes, Interreg, which is very much used between, uh, between within the member states, but also like it says, it's a neighboring uh, instrument. So there is access uh, to the, all the candidate countries to some Interreg programs. Um, also, uh, we are supporting uh, the country's uh, participation in union programs. So all this is to build uh, experience 
um, directly, um, for example, when you're managing the projects and programs, while managing them, um, you are creating your own your own capacity. Um, but it also opens opens up uh, various opportunities in the wrong line. Yes, so some 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 developments on the IPA front. Um, because um, yes, the world is evolving, and uh, and we need to make sure that everything is uh, is is improving and, and progressing and becoming easier for everyone involved. Um, Jill already mentioned uh, the the growth plan for the Western Balkans, which is a which is the newest uh, instrument, um, which aims at. Uh, bringing the, the Western Balkans uh, closer to to the levels of the European Union. I mean, it works mostly on economic integration, uh, supporting also regional uh, market, but also there's a big component on the, the fundamental uh, reforms. And here I would like to highlight the importance of the reform agendas, which the countries are asked to prepare to identify the biggest, biggest, uh, biggest, um, let's say, parts of importance uh, for their country and, and based on that um, um, the, they are going to request uh, the funding for, for the particular particular investments and this is also crucial uh, for the future implementation of the structural funds and cohesion policies when such, uh, such large-scale strategies uh, need to be uh, put in place. Here is an example of uh, of the the fields which are covered uh, by the growth plan. Um, I think the public financial management, administrative reforms, um, they are most directly uh, relevant for the chapter twenty two, but also everything else. So once again, you see that everything is is intertwined. And uh, I think finance wise, uh, the uh, the ins the growth plan. Um, the value of it is is really really significant. So I think we are making a quite good step towards uh, making sure that the Croatian case does not happen and that the funding which is flowing towards uh, the Western Balkans uh, is increasing and uh, and and will be <laughs> will will start to be comparable. So to avoid this absorption shock which which the countries have uh, received. Um, so this this pro plan currently is uh, is being discussed uh, um, in the trilogue between the Parliament and the Council as well as the Commission. So we expect this to be adopted uh, uh, with all the technical details uh, within the year. But this is a political process as everything. So let's see how it all goes. Yes. And uh, some words about the uh, the uh, implementing practices, which uh, which we are uh, trying to change as well. Um, this change happened to all the other accession uh, countries uh, previously as well. Everything started with the centralized management by the Commission, uh, then moving on to the indirect management. Um, so giving more and more responsibility for the countries themselves to uh, be in charge of, of funding, to establishing pipe pipelines, uh, doing the contracting, the procurements, um, having proper monitoring evaluation, and, uh, and that's, that's also having the, the responsibility both on the content and, and also on the financial terms. So we are currently moving um, using this nice term IMBC, Commission very much likes acronyms because the, everything is lengthy. So indirect management by beneficiary country means that uh, since um, since all, for example, for the Serbian case already since uh, 2013, uh, it, it has been possible for to use the indirect management much more closely, and uh, we are um, focusing on this IMBC framework, mostly on the uh, on the windows uh, of IPA, we call them windows, so they are kind of the, the biggest priorities, uh, which are the most relevant uh, for the future accession and, and cohesion policies. Um, under this IMBC, we talk about the multi-annual operational programs, which is also uh, parallel uh, from the from the cohesion and structural funds. So having uh, having multi-annual um, planning in place um, to direct the the strategic uh, reforms. 
So, for example, uh, Montenegro, it started already uh, in, uh, in under IPA 2 uh, with our operational programs. Um, and now uh, four Western Balkan countries are uh, are discussing and, and progressing. Um, hopefully, we will be in the IPA committee with, with our operational programs in May um, for this 2024-2027 uh, um, scale in mind. So in Montenegro, we will uh, we expect to have two new operational programs on environment and so employment, social policy, and uh, Serbia also will have two more or less the same fields: employment skills, social inclusion, environment, and energy. So these will be free, free, uh, free programs. Uh, sorry, uh, three-year programs. And uh, we are also negotiating and trying to move uh, more towards uh, ex post controls. Until now, uh, the uh, the EU delegations uh, have uh, have been um, kind of assisting or having are have had more role on the on the kind of parallel controls just to make sure that that the, the funding uh, is 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 continuously secured. And uh, but that also um, kind of stops the uh, the the beneficiary countries to kind of push and uh, train their own uh, capacity in in taking the the ultimate uh, decisions uh, regarding the, the funding and the project's implementation so this is ongoing ongoing effort uh, but we are progressing uh, quite well towards that direction also, with a new programming approach, um, we are talking about simplifying costs and having much more strategic approach than before. So I think we are moving along the same line of thinking uh, with DG Regio. Mm, yes, and um, that's more or less it. Really mm -hmm. happy to take any questions uh, that you have. Yeah, and, uh, thank you. good luck. Thank you. If there uh, are some questions, we are more than happy to share them. Okay. Uh, yes, in the meantime, can I ask you so please to uh, unshare? Thank you. Yes, done. Thank you. So, are there questions? No? Okay. Uh, well, we can even collect them later and let them let them have to our guest and and give the discussion going on offline. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much, Dr. Tim. Um, so now we are opening um, the next section, which is a presentation of the project with the result and the follow up. Next in line is uh, uh, Dr. Rafaela Coletti from CNR in CIFA. Hello. Let me try to share my screen. Just a moment. Technical issues as always. Okay. Um, I don't know. There's. Okay. Let me see if it works now. Okay. Yes. I have some problems, sorry. I don't know if uh, Observatorio can share the screen for me because I, I can't do it in my life. Let me see this. No. Um, there. I'm, I'm, there is so, something happening. Of, uh, yeah, but it's not me, I think. Oh. <laughs> I don't think it's me. <laughs> it's fact, it's something very weird going on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what. Um, aspect time. Okay. okay. Let's see what's happening. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. I have some problems uh, to share in the screen. Otherwise, I can do without. Yeah, I don't know if yeah, um, Roberta can help me, but I can start. Yeah, thank you very much, Roberta, for helping me. <laughs> I can start my presentation anyway. So thank you very much. Um, so I just uh, would like to give you some information on what we did with this project. Um, we see the screen, Roberta, but it stopped in a... Uh, I mean, it, it, the presentation is not open. Um, 
So the project, as Luisa already recalled, and also Director Salerno, was funded under the Know-How Exchange Program 2022, which is financed by the Central European Initiative Fund at the EBRD, contributed by Italy. Um, and the project started in November 2022 and will finish in April 2024. We have this final webinar today, but actually we are planning to have some uh, final um, uh, somehow follow-up activities in the next month. And also, as Luisa mentioned, we are actually continuing our activities, but I will um, mention this uh, later. Um, and we have uh, the partnership of the project. Uh, we, we still don't see the presentation. I don't know uh, uh, if we can. You can try to share it again, the screen. Um, perché fermo frizzato su final webinar così. Uh, sorry for these technical issues. Um, so the partners of the project have been already mentioned, but I will mention them again. They're all participating to this webinar today. We have uh, CNR Sirfa, we coordinated the proposal, but since the very beginning, we did this together with um, Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso Trans Europa and with uh, our partners in the region, who are uh, the Ministry of European Affairs of Montenegro, the Ministry of European Integration of Serbia, and the European Fund of um, the Autonomous Province of Vojvodina in Serbia again. Um, what we have done during this period, uh, we did um, different project activities. Uh, basically, the first thing was that after we uh, were granted with the project, so starting with November 2022, we started to have some meetings online with um, our partners to uh, define together the needs assessment. Um, we took this uh, moment very seriously as we tried to um, really have some, uh, to try to, to design some um, our activities um, in order to uh, really go um, towards um, some activities that were useful for our partners uh, and not only, um, you know, trying to, to set up a proposal that was actually useful for them. Um, then we, we prepared, based on these meetings, a proposal that we further discussed with our partners. And then we, between May and June, we carried out the training activities uh, in Belgrade, in Novi Sad, and in Podgorica. Um, and we had some, in the following months, some feedbacks, some contacts, especially because we left with some uh, assignments that was possible to do on a voluntary basis. Um, then in November, we had a study visit in Rome. Uh, and now we are doing this final webinar and, and with some follow-up activities. I'm very sorry that I cannot share the screen now because I had some very nice pictures of the of the training, but I don't know actually what to do. And it seems that uh, also um, it's um, Osservatorio Roberta is not able to show the screen. You can try uh, Roberta to uh, unlock, I mean, not to share the screen anymore and try to share it again because we have this, um, I don't know, phrased uh, it, image. Non funziona. No, eh, dovrebbe funzionare. Io Uscite vedo solo. Vedere. No, vediamo solo una cartella, una cartella ferma. Non c'è la condivisione della presentazione. Giusto? Mm -hmm. Am I right, Andrea? Vediamo la cartella. Sì, confermo dovresti... anch'io. Ah, dovresti provare a uscire e ri ri share again. Sorry again for these technical issues, but uh, sometimes it happens. I don't know. No, when... okay, oh, no. eccolo. Sì, Thank sì, you. Sì. Great. Now we see it. So perfect. Just in time for the pictures. Um, so these are some, some pictures and especially the titles and the dates of our trainings. And as you can see, the topics are different in the different um cities where we did the trainings um, and also the um, experts were different because actually we selected the team that went on the training based on the uh, 
um, needs assessment phase. So uh, as you can see, Andrea and I were always there, but then in uh, Belgrade, we had some colleagues from Politecnico di Torino, uh, Erblin Berisha and Loris Servillo, um, that are expert in particular on uh, territorial tools for cross-border, in cross-border areas, which was the topic selected by our partners of the um, Ministry of European Integration. And then in Novi Sad, we had Serena Epis from Osservatorio Balcani Caucas and Trans Europa. And in Podgorica, we had again Genchiola Madi from Osservatorio Balcani Caucas and Trans Europa. Um, and also, I would like to mention that we had the participation of the Italian embassies, uh, both in Podgorica and in um, uh, Belgrade, with Ambassador Andrina Marcella in Podgorica and Giuseppe Cirillo, the first councillor of the Italian embassy in Serbia, who participated to the meetings. Then this is the list of the people that participated to our study visit in Rome. And I decided to put the, the names and, and, and um, institutions to show you um, we, what kind of, first of all, what kind of approach we followed. So while in the training in uh, the region, we uh, had more an academic approach somehow, um, during the study visit, we involved um, a number of practitioners in order to um, also give to our colleagues the opportunity to speak with people who actually uh, implement cohesion policy from very different perspectives. And we had a number of public institutions at national, regional and local level, uh, but also private entities, associations and research center. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the guests. I've seen that some of them are uh, online following today's activity uh, because, of course, their contribution was crucial for the success of these two days. And we have been discussing a number of topics based on what we had already done in May and June in the region, uh, including uh, management of cohesion policy, condition, enabling conditions and conditionality, communication, the Italian strategy for inner areas, cross-border integrated strategies, and the role of cities. And uh, final information, as Louise already mentioned, we are currently developing the second edition of this project. Um, in this case, the project leader is Osservatorio Balcani, uh, and we have uh, old and new partners. We are the same basically group, but we have also um, the Secretariat of European Affairs of North Macedonia and the Agency for Strategic Programming and a Coordination of Albania. And we are planning to uh, have training in these countries in the next few months, but then we will have a, a reg regional event, most probably in Belgrade uh, in autumn, um, to, um, as Luisa was saying, add a regional dimension and discuss uh, together um, to um, try to also um, take the most of what we are doing in this project altogether. Um, so uh, I would like to thank you all, and uh, I would like to take this final slide. This is a picture taken um, during our study visit in front of the premises of the National Research Council in Rome. Um, so I would like to thank you all for your attention, but also would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, the donors, so the Central European Initiative and the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, but also the, the, all the partners, because I think this was really a very good collaboration. I personally learned a lot and had a very good time during this project and established a really very good relationship with all of you. And so I really hope we have the chance to continue our work together in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. I guess I definitely share the same ideas. Uh, now, um, can I leave the floor to uh, Sanda Stambolic, Ministry of European Integration of Serbia, that we met in Belgrade last, last year. She was guesting us. Uh, Sanda, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yes, we do. Super. Your voice quality is poor. Uh, that is what I received as a message from my computer, but if you hear me fine, then, then I will ignore the, this message. So everything is fine. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank very much to Che and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy for financing this project, but uh, uh, also to, to uh, thank to CNR and OBGT for implementing it. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, for, for us, you know, uh, one, one of the projects that you get best value for money, you know, it is, uh, there are small projects, but uh, uh, with, with uh, um, 
high quality professionals uh, that we uh, here in the ministry clicked in, in, in immediately almost, you know, and uh, uh, what you have, Rafaela, mentioned that you try to adapt to our, our needs, uh, although you had very, very small maneuvering space within the project with the amount of money and, and, and uh, the procedures. Um, this was really um, uh, uh, unbelievable, you know, because uh, we um, uh, were really uh, um, grateful and we are grateful for you being so uh, um, uh, flexible to adapt to our needs, because uh, what we had were very particular request, you know, uh, from the project, we wanted to explore whether this what we needed is something that you can provide and you stretch outside of your limits to do it. And uh, uh, found uh, really uh, uh, extraordinary experts who really um, not only helped us, but whose expertise and knowledge we can continue to use uh, in these particular topics, you know. Uh, we knew, of course, that Italy can uh, provide us with this kind of expertise uh, uh, and, and um, uh, that this is the example that we would like to hear about and, and use in the future. Uh, the, the surprise was that just you were able to adapt in this way. So what, uh, what was Serbia, as, as you, we have heard from uh, Gilles Kittel and, and from the colleagues from the engineer, is uh, uh, the beneficiary of, of a project that uh, prepare us for cohesion policy. We just today had a, had a, a training and meeting and exchange of opinions on competency frameworks and, and uh, how to prepare capacities and what should be the modules for training, etc. So um, we are in daily uh, in, on daily basis exposed to the uh, uh, expertise that is preparing us for cohesion policy. Uh, however, uh, European Territorial Cooperation, uh, it is the, the department that we are uh, coming from that we're beneficiary as a ministry of uh, European integration, but part regarding the territorial cooperation. Um, uh, territorial co cooperation is pretty specific. Why? Because uh, the programs, all the programs with member states or the interact programs are implemented using uh, using the, the uh, European structural investment funds uh, regulations. So we are not implementing IPA, we are implementing structural funds. And uh, uh, this is scary <laughs> because uh, uh, we need to uh, jump outside of, of, of comf comfort zone, let's say. Uh, why? Because uh, IPA 3 or IPA 2 uh, is not actually preparing us for, <laughs> for cohesion policy. The system that we have in place, it's not actually the system that, that um, will, will uh, resemble to the system that we will have in, uh, uh, when managing cohesion policy. Uh, and, and everybody knows that uh, there is no better training than the practice uh, when you are hands-on. Uh, and uh, since, uh, since a majority of people in Serbia are lacking that practice because IPA is not resembling uh, cohesion policy, uh, we in, uh, in territorial cooperation are very lucky uh, to have this, this direct insight into how the cohesion policy works. And one of the aspects of the cohesion policy that is of particular interest to us, why? Because uh, we are, uh, it's very uh, uh, necessary for us because we're imp implementing it in this financial perspective, is this territorial aspect of, uh, of the cohesion policy, uh, territorial cohesion and all the instruments that are being introduced by the uh, uh, European Commission and by the regulations in order to implement territorial cohesion. And those instruments are this integrated territorial strategies and all the instruments that are being uh, used to support specific integrated territorial needs. Uh, uh, given that uh, it is very difficult to do on national level, <laughs> um, uh, it is even more difficult to do it on transnational level or on cross-border level. This is really a challenge. So we spoke to uh, uh, Rafaela and her team and, and uh, uh, asked her if, 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 if uh, uh, Chinar is possible 
to provide us with this kind of expertise and training. And uh, surprisingly, uh, we found a, a kindred spirit, you know, <laughs> because she's a spatial planner, and and these are uh, these are her also uh, territories of interest, let's say. And uh, we were really, really very lucky to to find this uh, this uh, common uh, uh, interest, you know, and. Uh, um, what what uh, projects have produced and i'm very sorry the project did not have enough funds you know to bring uh, the whole team in in rome uh, to listen to all the uh, incredible uh, presentations and and people who came to talk us uh, to talk to us uh, uh, about very interesting topics and about uh, things that uh, in Italy, uh, Italy is, is, is working on for ages, you know. So these experts are really the ones that uh, uh, do not need the presentations, you know. These are the people who are speaking, who are, who are explaining their own lives, you know, everyday lives, uh, and who could, uh, could, uh, could uh, um, uh, uh, reply on, on every question. Uh, particularly, you know, the strategy for inner areas in Italy, uh, how Italy have, uh, have uh, uh, faced this issue of, of diverse, diverse uh, regional uh, 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 situations throughout Italy from north to south, uh, different, uh, 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 different uh, uh, each, each Italian region and each region within the Italian region is, is different, um, different situation. And, uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Luisa. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, 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 this kind of uh, this kind of experience that Italy uh, does have, uh, given that also Italians are uh, not very much Italo-centric, but very much uh, um, interested uh, in the Western Balkan regions and and cooperation. So this kind of blend is it was really something that was uh, uh, value, valuable to us. Um, uh, so uh, what I wanted also to say, I don't want to. You will all receive what were the, the results of the of the project, what kind of uh, trainings we have received, what kind of uh, uh, benefits uh, uh, we had. We did uh, uh, try to tackle the issue of cross border territorial uh, integrated territorial strategies. Why? Because we are having one for program Bulgaria Serbia now, and we don't have a clue, you know, how to implement it in a proper way. Uh, and we and no, there is nobody to tell us what is the proper way, you know, and how how to guide us. So we need to receive as much information as possible and other experiences in order to properly uh, uh, help, uh, <laughs> you know, our territories to to benefit from 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 PO5. Uh, that we have now in, in a program with Bulgaria. And uh, uh, in many other programs, uh, we are now, it's 2024, but everybody knows that uh, European Union is preparing itself for post-2027 uh, period. And um, uh, given that uh, interreg programs are so close to structural funds and that Regio is, uh, um, uh, we are lucky to have them really, is uh, uh, embracing all the non-member states participating in interreg programs involving non-member states uh, to consult with us, which is really a privilege. Uh, this kind of uh, 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 approach, this kind of attitude of the European Commission towards us to include us uh, in, uh, in the phase of policy development, this is really something that is uh, uh, that is uh, that we are taking very seriously and we respect a lot and we are extremely grateful, you know, because in majority of the cases we see things when they're already done uh, and and packages that are already you know uh, uh, in place, whether it is regulation or strategy or whatever, it cannot influence. Uh, so this this uh, life that we are living right now, you know, is is really. Uh, uh, one of the the best uh, uh, moments in in our careers, you know, because we are now involved uh, Urbact, for example, Urbact program, which we are uh, um, introduced in this financial perspective, and that is also one of the things that we are very grateful about, because we are now in interregional programs, which is Interreg Europe, uh, Urbact, and uh, uh, Espon program. It is of immense importance. 
uh, uh, for us uh, and for our beneficiaries of these programs. Uh, so the Urbel program have included us into the citizens and stakeholders uh, consultation program for, for post-2027. Uh, we are uh, part uh, of the uh, working group or of the group of people who is uh, uh, cooperating uh, in review of the territorial agenda for 2030, which is also uh, unbelievable benefit for us. Uh, also, ESPON is conducting, uh, uh, together with Interac, a project of stock taking review of the Territorial Agenda 2030, which also we are taking part of uh, uh, possible renewal of, of uh, uh, Territorial Agenda in 2025. Uh, it is coming to us. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we are grateful to being given an opportunity to position territorial agenda into preparation of cohesion policy post 2027 and that uh, we are uh, we are a part of it. So uh, everything that we have learned from from this project, uh, we are investing into all our today's activities, uh, not only in the programs themselves, in implementation of the programs, but also in thinking and rethinking how to do things in the future post-2020. Uh, uh, so uh, um, I, I will not take uh, uh, more of your time again. Uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are not direct part of the next uh, project that Rafaela have mentioned. And this is, um, I don't know, uh, uh, we would like to be. Uh, we would like to be very much. And uh, I'm really looking forward uh, we will we will not stop following the results of that project, and uh, 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 I'm really looking forward to uh, to to uh, be part of the the final conference that will take place uh, uh, in Belgrade. I really hope so, and uh, that we will be able to be part of the, this project indirectly, uh, but to to see the outcomes uh, uh, of that project. But what I am absolutely sure that we will continue to cooperate professionally that we will seek uh, uh, really uh, your, your assistance in everything that we need because we are very much relying on all of your uh, uh, ex expertise. So again, uh, I would like to ask Ivana if she, she has something to add. No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so again, Andrea, Rafaela, thank you very much. And really, Luisa, looking forward to, uh, to uh, uh, continue the cooperation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the kind of words. Also, Hi to Ivan, that was next Sunday. Nice to see you again. Uh, okay, so uh, next in the agenda I have uh, Irana Boscovich, Ministry of European Affairs of Montenegro. Okay, good afternoon uh, from Montenegro as well. Uh, here in the room, meeting room of the Ministry of European Affairs are my, my colleagues from the NIPAC office and uh, myself. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, to greet you and uh, on behalf of the Ministry of European Affairs, and we are very pleased uh, that we have gathered uh, this webinar to present the results of the project. Uh, and of course, the fact that we have had the opportunity to cooperate with Rafaela and the, her team on this project, uh, also with our dear colleagues from uh, from Serbia. Uh, it is, I believe, worth pointing out that this project is of great importance for us as it highlights the crucial aspects of uh, the activities within the Chapter 22, which deals with regional policy and coordination of structural instruments in the context of Serbia and Montenegro sea accession process. Uh, through the various activities uh, Rafael also mentioned and uh, Sanda as well, uh, Montenegro has actively uh, participated in this project uh, and thus demonstrating its commitment to align with the standards and practices. Uh, of course, uh, one of the key highlights of Montenegro's involvement uh, includes the training session uh, which was conducted in the, uh, for the working group for Chapter 22 in June last year in Podgorica. And uh, of course, these uh, sessions have provided valuable insights and knowledge, uh, equipping the staff of the ministry and members of the uh, working group with all necessary tools uh, to effectively tackle the uh, complexities of regional policy uh, coordination. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have had, uh, as mentioned also by uh, Rafaela, uh, the study visit for, uh, to Rome, 
uh, it was very important uh, to facilitate uh, deeper understanding and best practices, of course, in the uh, successful strategies in this field implemented by Italy. And uh, we are very grateful to, uh, to have this experience. And uh, by exchanging the experiences and learning from our uh, European counterparts, uh, we have, uh, it uh, surely have comp uh, contributed to strengthening capacities uh, so as to prepare as for future implementation uh, for uh, of the regional policies. Mm, and uh, now, as we reflect on these uh, past activities, uh, I would like also to emphasize the ongoing efforts of Montenegro within the chapter 22, as Jim mentioned uh, at the beginning. <clears throat> We opened this chapter in 2017. Uh, in 2015, we prepared the action plan uh, for meeting the EU cohesion policy. Uh, and now, uh, this year, we will uh, be working on the revision of this uh, action plan since, since uh, uh, a huge num number of years passed uh, uh, since uh, 2015. And we are, uh, of course, uh, committed to further en enhancing the regional policy frameworks promoting cross-border cooperation and fostering social economic development uh, at the local and regional level. Uh, so looking ahead, uh, we are undertaking significant steps in the in terms of revision of the action plan. And uh, in order to maximize, uh, of course, uh, uh, the utilization of EU funds uh, to ensure an alignment with the EU standards and priorities. Uh, we plan it to be developed uh, during this year, adopted uh, by the end of this year. So uh, we we are going to face very challenging period of, of ahead of us. And of course, projects like this uh, can really uh, assist us uh, both in the ministry and the working group uh, in this process, uh, because we uh, are having the opportunity to tackle all the important tasks within this chapter. Uh, so, in conclusion, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to all the partners and stakeholders involved in the project uh, for the dedication and uh, cooperation. Uh, I think that uh, together we are paving the way towards a more cohesive and uh, prosperous future of Montenegro within, within the European Union. And uh, uh, I would like also to mention that we are very pleased that this project is uh, expanded to additional two countries and that we will have the opportunity to jointly implement activities with colleagues from uh, North Macedonia and Albania. So I believe in the upcoming period, we will have, as, uh, as Rafael also announced, uh, this joint event uh, <clears throat> in the region and to, to, to have the opportunity to meet uh, in person and discuss all this uh, important aspects of uh, of these uh, processes and the chapter 22. So thank you from my side and uh, I'm here of course for uh, any other questions and clarifications. Thank you, thank you very much. So yes, we are also very looking forward for continuing our Balkan tour in the, in the coming spring. Uh, next, uh, Jano Puska, European Affairs Fund uh, Vojvodina that we've met also uh, last year. Jano, how are you? Hello, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, great. Nice meeting you all again. Uh, and hello from Novi Sad. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to all of our project partners for the opportunity uh, to participate in this kind of uh, project uh, and also donors for financing the, the project. Uh, as for us, uh, this opportunity to uh, participate in the project uh, has provided a significant uh, insight on the overall EU cohesion policy structure within the EU programs and, and cross-border cooperation. Uh, it has also resulted with a, uh, provider a much clearer picture on the complexity of the topic. Uh, while also clarifying the position of uh, the regional government, the regional government bodies uh, such as European Affairs Fund, uh, within the context of, of the, the cohesion policy. Uh, as you already mentioned, we uh, within the project we had participated in uh, uh, organizing uh, in the organization of the training on EU cohesion policy principles, possibilities, uh, and perspectives in Vojvodina in Novi Sad. And also, we participated in a study visit uh, in Italy that has provided us with uh, functional and practical 
uh, knowledge uh, on the topics uh, that were men mentioned. Uh, also, the topics uh, within this this uh, education uh, were related to in Ovisad were related to smart specialization set strategies, territorial development, and concepts of functional areas, cross border areas, inner areas, and uh, urban centers. Uh, uh, the training in Vojvodina has uh, brought together uh, various representatives of uh, local self government from the territory of Vojvodina, the provincial government, uh, and uh, also the, the uh, regional development agencies. Uh, and the discussion during this event has uh, covered the future of the cohesion policy and the role of uh, regions within, within the, the, uh, the cohesion policy. Uh, this is this was a really uh, insightful topic uh, for us uh, because uh, we maybe didn't have an, enough uh, possibilities to participate in this kind of uh, activities or this kind of uh, education workshops. Uh, and uh, the result of the project for us uh, uh, include not only a better knowledge and understanding of the uh, programming phase of the EU cohesion policy by the users, but also uh, the need for creation of uh, national and transnational network between the various stakeholders uh, groups, I mean local, regional, non-governmental and uh, other, for the exchange of uh, knowledge in the field of uh, cohesion policy. And from our perspective, uh, this is the, almost the most important part uh, in order to efficiently uh, understand uh, and uh, to participate uh, in, in the process uh, and in this regard we think that the development of uh, mechanisms which uh, could help to further multiply the results uh, identified within this, this project uh, and maybe to include a component uh, of further coordination and networking with uh, partners and also the stakeholders that uh, participated in this uh, project. Uh, especially when it comes to financing already established priorities uh, in the context of creating intra-regional uh, partnerships uh, or cooperation projects uh, and defining some initiatives uh, gathered uh, around the common priorities of the regional uh, authorities. Uh, and so, you know, to conclude, uh, I think that uh, there is a strong need to continue with uh, similar actions and projects that could further promote the, mainly the knowledge sharing uh, in order to motivate uh, stakeholders, such as regional and local actors, to uh, participate uh, in, the, in the process. Uh, so, uh, Andrea and uh, Rafaela, thank you, and we look forward for our future cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Okay, so we have finished this um, section. We are pretty much on time. Uh, in the last part, we invited two guests from Italian institutions that deal with cohesion policy. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Andrea Cascone. He's the director of the Adriatic and uh, sorry, yeah, Adriatic and Balkan unit of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Dr. Cascone, are you here with us? Yes, hello. I hope you can uh, hear me. Uh, yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, let me uh, thank you uh, for uh, the uh, nice invitation to this webinar. It is a very good opportunity uh, to highlight, of course, Italy's commitment uh, to uh, regional cooperation, which is embodied by the Central European Initiative. So let me recall this is the oldest regional organization dealing with Central and uh, Southeast Europe. But it also is an opportunity to, for me to underline once more uh, our commitment, our steadfast support to Serbia and Montenegro in their uh, European path. Uh, and, uh, and again, another um, clear indication of uh, our willingness to invest and to uh, contribute to the acceleration of this process. This is really a very um, timely uh, uh, event because uh, uh, there is indeed a new momentum in Brussels in the discussion among the EU member states 
uh, about the enlargement process. I know that in the region, when we talk about new momentum on the enlargement, there is still a lot of skepticism. Uh, but this is the uh, reality and uh, the message we continue to pass to all our friends and partners in the region is that they should seize this opportunity and uh, make the best use of it. Uh, of course, our commitment is to uh, make this uh, uh, promise a reality. Uh, you may be aware that Italy hosted recently in February uh, a ministerial meeting here in Rome with the ministers of foreign affairs from the Western Balkans and some new member states that are uh, advocating and fully dedicated to accelerating the integration process. Uh, the recently announced growth plan by the European Commission uh, is really a unique uh, tool for uh, uh, progressing along this path. Also because it, it um, focuses on what we believe is now, should be now the top priority of the integration process, which is the gradual integration of the region in the European Union. Uh, and this is very much connected to the topic you are discussing, which is cohesion policy, which is a crucial tool for achieving also to contribute to this integration of the, um, uh, of the region with the Western Balkans. Uh, gradual integration is uh, long-term investments uh, we believe this is, first of all, uh, in interest of the European Union because it helps candidate countries to uh, get acquainted and familiarized with the EU procedure, with the institutional life, and to uh, give a clear sign to their citizens that the integration is coming. It's not just uh, uh, empty words, and it also translates in concrete benefits. Now, the growth plan has a very ambitious agenda. Uh, we are very much encouraged by the very positive uh, feedback we have received from the region uh, and the interest of uh, uh, making this uh, story a success story. When it comes to cohesion policy, I just wanted to underline that uh, this is uh, uh, the idea of using cohesion policy also for the enlargement uh, is actually relatively new. Uh, this is uh, something that for the case of uh, Serbian and Montenegro, found a, a useful framework in the EU strategy for the Adriatic Union initiative, sorry, um, strategy. Uh, and uh, um, and it's, uh, it, it's something that is, we are currently now working on because the strategy was launched in uh, 2014. Uh, and in its first phase, uh, uh, we, the, the focus on the enlargement was not very clear. Uh, so we developed uh, mainly uh, policies uh, uh, and tried to streamline national policies uh, related to uh, territorial cooperation. But with the new phase, the 2021-2027, I mean, we started to discuss on how we could make uh, enlargement and horizontal issue for the strategy to be uh, implemented. Uh, we are currently now um, discussing the uh, revision of the action plan of user strategy with the aim of approving it before uh, the end of the presidency, which is all uh, held now by Croatia. Uh, this will provide the opportunity for countries like Serbia and Montenegro to uh, use the strategy in a more accurate way for also uh, improving their um, capacity to meet uh, uh, negotiations benchmarks on, uh, on chapter 22. Uh, the strategy focuses on key issues for uh, their uh, negotiations from uh, environmental protection uh, to uh, economic uh, sustainable, sustainable development, uh, including connectivity and uh, energy. So um, it is, uh, of course, uh, as I said, it's the start of a, a new journey uh, for a cohesion policy. But I mean, uh, this is a very promising uh, um, dynamic that we hope it will uh, uh, bring uh, very uh, important fruits for uh, for uh, countries like Serbia and Montenegro. I just want to conclude this uh, uh, short remarks by uh, underlining uh, once again uh, uh, the, uh, um, the importance of the tool that is uh, uh, actually financing this project, which is the Know-How Exchange Program. Uh, a tool that is, uh, is based on the um, support that Italy has always provided to the Central European Union and to the beneficiary countries of the initiative, including Serbia Montenegro. 
I'm very uh, happy uh, to hear the positive feedback uh, that our friends in, in Serbia Montenegro gave about this uh, tool, which uh, has a lot of potential to help candidate countries to get closer to the European Union standards uh, on, uh, on many sectors, including, of course, uh, cohesion policy. Uh, our, uh, I can just confirm Italy is fully uh, uh, committed to continue investing in this tool. And uh, in fact, I believe that also other can candidate countries are very much interested in developing similar programs, which is a very encouraging sign for us. And I look forward to continuing uh, uh, our joint uh, work with you, with Osservatorio, uh, for uh, uh, implementing this uh, kind of project. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Cascone, thank you. Thank you for being with us and also for the whole uh, management of the project. Um, next, we have Dr. Issa Milena Rose for, from the Cohesion Department, Cohesion Policy Department of the uh, Italian Presidents of Council of Ministers. Uh, Dr. Issa Rose, please, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Andrea, and good morning, uh, everyone. And um, thank you again for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Uh, thank you also from my head of OS office, Paolo Galletta, who was unable to participate due to previous commitment. Um, anyway, he's the, the head of the office of the 18 service of the Department for Question Policy, which is the national authority uh, that together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs deals with the implementation monitoring and coordination of controls of a European Territorial Cooperation Program with Italian participation. Um, I, I prepare, we prepare together with my head of office some uh, conclusion for uh, uh, the webinar, but for the nice experience and project that, uh, that you had in stressing some uh, keywords and the concept, uh, the same that uh, uh, something, some of that are the same that I heard during uh, this webinar. Um, the, the colleagues from uh, DG Rigio and the engineers, but also the colleagues from Serbia say some important concept about European territorial cooperation programs. Uh, just think about the, the actual programming period that uh, um, at the beginning, it was not uh, uh, automatic that we had uh, new new uh, states uh, in interregional programs. For example, we know um, that the the European territorial cooperation programs uh, try to open to new countries, of course, and also this means uh, to give um, an important. Uh, uh, value uh, how Interreg uh, can help cohesion policy and, of course, can help enlargement of the EU, EU member. Um, we have to stress uh, a, a basic concept, but sometimes it's worthwhile to remember that uh, um, Interreg programs is a sort of tool that guarantees, of course, the enlargement of the EU, but this means that uh, it will not be achieved to the detriment of the regions of the current member states. Uh, this means that uh, um, we, we care about uh, candidate countries, uh, we, care, we care about third countries, but this doesn't uh, mean that we will leave um, tools and opportunity to the member states. So the, the interreg objective can and must pave the way for cohesion policy to favor enlargement. And we have already seen in, uh, in the actual situation, in the real situation that we have, programs which have opened to the Western Balkans as Albania, Bos Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, uh, Serbia and North Macedonia, and as well as uh, to the East, just think about uh, Ukraine, for example, or Georgia or Mo Moldova. This means that the, the importance in ensuring an effective integration of the future member states without jeopardizing investment in current EU region. Uh, this we can better understood if we, we imagine and we see uh, the interreg programs for, um, from several and uh, key perspectives. 
The first uh, is uh, reducing disparities, of course. The Interreg program, uh, as we, we know, aim to reduce the socioeconomic disparities between EU regions, EU area, and the neighbor countries. Uh, by focusing on common challenges and opportunities, these programs help ensure to the process of integrating new member states. And this means that they um, altogether don't exacerbate existing inequalities or create new ones. Is a sort of balanced approach that supports an harmonious development across all the continent. The, the second important point is that thanks to the Interreg program, we can work to share knowledge and the best practice. Um, the, the Serbian colleagues uh, spoke about uh, uh, policy objective number five, of course, uh, that is the core of, uh, it's one of the, the policy objective that all uh, the 19 uh, um, cooperation programs where Italy currently is participating, they, they face. This means that uh, uh, interact program may facilitate the sharing of knowledge, for example, expertise, best practice across borders. The exchange is invaluable for candidate countries, helping them to adapt and implement uh, EU standards in a, merry, in a more effective way. Uh, and for the current uh, EU members, uh, it is not uh, just an exercise, but it's something that can offer a fresh perspective and solution to local and regional issue. This uh, sort of mutual learning process can help the overall administrative and capacity of region across Europe in this way, uh, ensuring that integration of new members add a, an added value without diluting the quality of investment in existing regions. Um, another point that uh, I, I would like to, to stress is the fostering a, a sense of European identity. Uh, it's normal that uh, if we uh, encourage collaboration using Interreg pro program, this means that we can foster partnership across border. Uh, this means that the program uh, may help to build a stronger sense of European identity and solidarity. This means that cultural and social integration um, may be crucial as economic integration, ensuring not only the expansion of EU, um, uh, EU strong point to the Union, but rather than diluting it. A, a united Europe, of course, is a better, uh, will have a better position to take all collective challenges and celebrate so shared success and creating a more cohesive and resilient Union. Then, uh, thanks to the Interreg program, uh, we can support cross-border infrastructure and service. Uh, this means that uh, for the first time uh, we have uh, specific financial allocation for specific uh, potential beneficiaries uh, focusing on developing of, of cross-border infrastructure and service, which are critical for the seamless integration of the new member states. Uh, in fact, by investing in uh, transportation, in digital connectivity, uh, environmental protection, social service, just the, the main fields, the main uh, operation fields, these programs uh, help mitigate the risk of creating new peripheries or border issue with, within the, the European Union. Improved connectivity and service support, social and economic cohesion, of course, ensuring that the benefits of EU membership are uh, something that we can touch, is, uh, uh, is something that uh, will be tangible for both current and prospective member states. And then uh, um, Mr. Kittel spoke uh, about the, the acquis communautaire that, of course, this, uh, this is another uh, uh, main goal of interreg programs uh, to, to 
uh, to give uh, a, 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 an opportunity, a more opportunity in order to reach an alignment with EU policies and regulation. In fact, through the participation in the REG program, future EU member states uh, can valuable experience in aligning with the policies and the regulation. It's a sort of a preparatory work that we, uh, we can use in order to reinforce integration process, of course. And it also means an investment, a con something that will continue, will go on on time and uh, we can also better prepare for the next programming period. Um, I, I heard some, uh, um, uh, some quotation about what we are preparing now and what is preparing the European Commission in supporting uh, us uh, for the post-2027. This is the, the right time uh, to think about our future and the, the future of the, the new member states. Um, the European Territorial Cooperation Programs in this context uh, will be uh, pivotal in assuring that the exp expansion of the EU uh, will be a positive, of course. And in this way, uh, we can help uh, all the, the territorial cohesion in, uh, in general. We have to emphasize the, the potential effects of uh, interreg program on uh, enlargement, of course. Uh, we have to we, we don't have to forget the past, but we have to learning from the past and proposing future strategies. All in this way, we can underline the main role of European Territorial Cooperation Program and also the main role that uh, had the macro regional strategies. Uh, Mr. Cascona spoke about the EUSAIR strategies, that, that is the, the main tool that we, we are using, that we have to use uh, also in, cons in consideration of the, 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 the great work that made Montenegro and Serbia in, uh, in the project that, uh, uh, that you, you presented us uh, this morning. All in, all in this way, uh, working all, uh, all together, and uh, without forgetting our history, but uh, in a, and having an, a, a vision of uh, our future, we can uh, we can uh, uh, reinforce the unity and the prosperity of the ability of the candidate count countries. Um, the, the the role of a European territorial cooperation goes well beyond the classic and the basic investment. Uh, because uh, uh, it's not just to, to build the streets or, or bridge, but it's something more. We, we often uh, spoke about uh, how to improve institutional, how to improve uh, capacity building. Uh, so um, welcome to the twinning program, welcome to the program and the project that can reinforce the, the capacity building and to support the civil society, the social partner. Uh, we have to, to, to base uh, all uh, our works in institutional improvements because all in this way we can prepare all together the ground for more effective public policies and to have a, a great development. In conclusion, um, enlargement towards the Western Balkans and the East uh, is very strategically important. This enlargement poses substantial challenges, but also offers uh, big and major opportunities. Its success, of course, will depend on a joint effort from the EU policymaker, member state, uh, who uh, must and we uh, should demonstrate the political will and so also have the, the strong to allocate the, necess the necessary resources, the necessary funds to make it a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I do agree. There is, very, there is more than what we see uh, when we run these kind of programs. Uh, we have time to collect a couple of questions for Dr. Rosa and Dr. Cascona, if there are questions from our guests or from, from those who are attending online, we are happy. You can also put them on the chat if you like. 
<clears throat> well, in the meantime, let me, uh, well, let me just wrap up very quickly. It was very interesting and you know, full of insights. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, just following up was, um, Milena was just saying, but also Sand before, on this idea that there is more than what we see in terms of programs outcomes. And being part of this program, I was one of those who uh, was uh, going around in Serbia last, last year, Montenegro, and we keep doing this for this year, well, I can tell you that there is there are a lot of indirect results, indirect outcomes from this kind of exchange programs that we do, we do not see them. They are intangible, but they are very valuable. Exchanging ideas, exchanging uh, standpoints, uh, increasing the common understanding of how similar we are, but also how do we like our differences? We do like how different we are. So there's something. Uh, to build on. So these kind of exchange programs, I think they have benefits which are larger than one we, where, how we see them in, in terms of you know tangible results and outcomes. So I think they are very, very uh, welcome. Um, I think um, done with it. I'm, quest I'm wondering whether uh, you know Rafaela or Luisa or Julio want to add something. If I may, I just would like to take two minutes to um, thank everybody participating to this meeting. I would like uh, to thank in particular um, Gilles Kittel and Tim Enil from the European Commission for not only for participating, but for letting us know the state of the art in terms of enlargement and cohesion. It was very interesting. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. Cascone and Milan Rosa for their emphasis on EUSER and Interreg programs and on the role that Italy is playing in this framework, because uh, we really think, I mean, uh, also together with Luisa and Osservatorio, the, the, the uh, underlying um, idea of this project uh, was exactly that we really believe that working together on cohesion policy can support the enlargement more generally. And of course, uh, the relevance of interreg programs and EUSER framework in these is crucial. So we um, we are uh, very, um, so, so thank you very much for, for uh, um, putting the emphasis on this. Um, and finally, I would like to thank again um, our colleagues, and in particular Sanda, Ivana, and Irena, and Jano for being with us today, for sharing their experience, and but most of all for the collaboration that you had, you and all your teams, uh, last year on this project, and we really look forward to continue working together for the regional event in the autumn this year, but more on that, more on um, more. Um, uh, after that, I mean, to have further collaboration and exchange. We really hope we will have the chance to continue on this path in the future. Andrea, is, I would like to thank especially Raffaella for all the works. Uh, and uh, thank you, Raffaella. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you at all. Uh, it has been um, this project a uh, very exciting experience for us. And I hope a new collaboration with all, um, all you together. And I hope uh, you to see you in Rome <laughs> in, a, in a next experience. Thank you, Adol. Okay. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. We are super uh, in time. Uh, so you have a good day. And I'm sure we're going to see each other very soon somewhere. You have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye